Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. What are we gonna unbox and review today? It's something from the new 2020 Epiphone collection. Now this is kind of a, a re-unboxing, but I swear I haven't touched this guitar for more than about five minutes after the initial unboxing in this episode. This is Epiphone's re-release of the SG that they did last year in the Gibson lineup, where they offered two different types of tremolo styles, as well as just a stop bar tailpiece. I reviewed both of the Gibson iterations, and honestly, I sent both of those things back to the store because I could not keep those tremolo units in tune. So will this one be any better? That is pretty much the whole entire reason why I got this one to do a review and demo on, because I was curious if China could do it better. Better. So first impressions on this guy. I'm not in love with the way that this neck feels. It's kind of what I've been talking with on a few guitars, where it has a lot of shoulder, but it's really flat on the back. I guess apparently people must like that if they keep making it. So that's something that makes this feel a little bit different from that Gibson iteration. And something that just kind of looks a little bit goofy, and most people agreed with me on this, is the veneer on the face of this guitar. I mean, it looks pretty nice, you know, at first glance, but then once you see the sides, it's like, what's going on here? It would be way too difficult for them to continue that onto the edges. So I, I get why they do it the way they do, but it just looks a little bit goofy. But now that I know what to expect, I think it does make the guitar look a little bit fancier. So I understand what they're doing. The first impressions of playing this thing, it's kind of uh, strange. It has a very plinky sound to it. It's very loud acoustically, I like that. But at the same time, I think we need a little bit more relief in the neck to kind of reduce some of the fret buzzing issues on this one. But some of that might have to do with leveling as well. So we'll have to figure that all out. Let's go ahead and take a look at some beauty shots of this guy and learn a little bit more about this model. And then we'll throw it on the workbench and get a playing demo. For the 2020 Winter NAMM show, Gibson revived Epiphone by doing two major things. First off, the decision was made to revive the old Kalamazoo styled headstock. This brought the return of a more traditional open book headstock style to replace the old clipped ear style that Epiphone has been using for well over 30 years. While this one might not be perfect either in everyone's eyes, it definitely takes Epiphone back to its own historical roots and gave us something to talk about at NAMM. The next topic to talk about is Epiphone mirrored Gibson's decision from 2019 to offer an original and modern collection, basically just to make it easier for buyers to find the products that they want. It depends if you prioritize vintage looks or modern playability and aesthetics. These new models are planned to always be available, but they might do some slight color slash spec changes or throw some different models in throughout the years. This particular instrument is part of the original collection of SGs. Other models within the series include an SG Special with wraparound tailpiece and P90 pickups, the SG Standard with batwing pickguard, and another SG Standard in the 61 variation, which comes in both a stop bar variety as well as this one that we're talking about today with the Maestro Vibrola, but the Vibrola edition costs $100 more. And the most expensive one from the bunch is the Epiphone SG Custom at $579. So none of these guitars are ridiculously expensive, but keep in mind, these do not come with cases or gig bags. You will have to purchase those separately. So now that I'm done tearing this one apart, let's go ahead and look at its parts and specs. Don't ever question my dedication to this channel. <laughs> I accidentally deleted the original footage of this. So as you can see, this thing takes forever to take apart and put back together, and I had to do it twice. I mean, it'd be one thing if it was that camera or this camera, but it just happened to have been my main camera I accidentally deleted. So let's go ahead and dive into this thing. So with everything removed, we can see the Epiphone Pro Bucker pickups in here. It's the Pro Bucker 2 in the neck position and the Pro Bucker 3 in the bridge. It's kind of an interesting thing within this one. You've got the infinity and beyond sign <laughs> and the uh, QR code that they use at the factory to identify it. And that's the same serial number that you'll find on the back of the headstock. Now, as far as the routes go themselves, they're actually looking pretty good. I don't see any splintered wood or anything like that. It's just all nice and smooth with an even staining. Now, as far as the neck tenon itself, you can see the neck right there because it doesn't have the veneer over top of it. But the way it ends is a little bit strange but that is a nice solid join. Sometimes on the Gibson variations, there's like lines and apparently it's still okay to be like that because I've seen it enough times, but I always appreciate a good join line like that. 
As far as our pickup readings go, it's a hot 8.42 in the bridge, and the neck position is a little less at 7.89, and the middle, just for fun, 4.08. Moving on to the bridge here, it is the Epiphone Loctone style bridge. So if you've missed my other Epiphone reviews, essentially there's a little metal ring in here that has little ridges on it that kind of locks this into place. That's supposed to make it so when you're working on the guitar, it will not fall off. Kind of like the Tone Pro stuff, but without the Allen keys. And it's also supposed to help your sustain. But the bridge itself is ABR1 in style in the fact that it has a wire retainer and the screws will be facing this way but it's still mounted within the body with studs, kind of like they're doing the original USA Gibson version once now. Now for the $100 premium you pay to get one of these systems, I think it would have been nice if it could actually be convertible, like they actually have the stop bar tailpiece under here in case you decide that you don't like it. But as you can see, it's a one and done type situation. You would have these additional holes even if you were to drill a stop bar tailpiece in here. But let's take a minute and actually look at this Lyre Vibrola system. I was curious how this one would differentiate between the Gibson versions because what if somebody takes this off and tries to sell it as the Gibson version? Here's your main differences. So your outside cover plate here, it actually reads Epiphone on it. That's a really cool sight. I'm glad they did that. And you can see the liar etched into that. No, I'm not a liar. That's what this little harp thing is called. <laughs> But here's the unit itself. It's secured by these four screws and then two right here. That's the first big difference between the Epiphone and the Gibson variant. Look at these screws. They're all the same size. On the Gibson version, these are actually much larger screws. So you could say that that version mounts more securely. I don't think it makes a huge difference, but it's something that you can note. And the other thing that is different is the back here. The way that the arm mounts, you see how there's that kind of recessed circle? The Gibson iteration does not have that. So that's two ways that you can see it. And the other thing I noticed is the Epiphone variation actually comes off way easier than the Gibson version. I had tried to do this in my last review and I could not get that thing to come off because they had that bent on really strong. All the vintage ones that I've had have been easy to move like this one though, but maybe that's just because they were worn down over the years. And lastly, the Gibson variation has a big hole under it that's used as the grounding channel. Epiphone doesn't have that. But just in case you haven't seen one of these before, essentially it's a very primitive Vibrola tailpiece here. All you're doing is slightly bending the metal, hoping it returns back to its normal shape. And that cover gets secured by four screws along the edges. These things are ridiculously cool looking, but in terms of function, I normally find that the tuning stability is not the best. I mean, you could do things like install roller saddles as well as lubricating your nut up really nicely and get them to be functioning. But typically right out of the box, I always have tuning instability issues with these guys. But I am happy to say that this one actually functions a little bit better than the Gibson variant, and I think it all comes down to the bridge. Because last time those bridges would flex when you would use this. But this one has a larger stud, so it actually kind of fights against that. I'll show you that here in a minute. I actually have pretty high hopes that this one might stay in tune. As far as the controls go, we have two volumes and two tones, one for each pickup, and a three-way selector switch here. The knob orientation was a little bit weird when I got it, like 10 was up here, so I went ahead and moved those. That was no issue. And here's what it looks like if you take the pickguard off. You do have the continuation of that flamey veneer. And the pickguard itself is rather thick feeling. That's kind of a nice quality product, I would say. And the tenon cover is single ply. I never have to put another one of these back together again. <laughs> it's not too hard. I actually find this one a little bit easier than the Gibson variation because the Gibson screws are a real pain in the butt. But the body here, it's completely made out of mahogany. Then you have the veneer that's kind of Sapelian style. I'm not sure if that's exactly the type of mahogany that they use, but that's what gives it that kind of flamed figuring. And you just got that bright orange color around the edges. I think that's the biggest thing that makes this thing look weird is the color differentiation. I wonder if they could put like a lighter colored stain over top of this to match that better because that's the only thing that makes this a little bit jarring. But the more and more you look at this thing, the fancier it does appear. But moving on from the mahogany body, we have a mahogany neck with an Indian Yanny fretboard. Now these Laurel fretboards, usually after you condition them with a little bit of lemon oil or whatever you prefer to use, they get a nice rosewood-like color. Essentially the biggest difference that I see between these guys is you have quite a bit of wood grain that sometimes you can actually feel with your nail. Like listen to this. 
but I've never noticed it really affecting the playability of these guitars. But you have 22 medium jumbo frets, which is like the standard fret wire that Gibson uses, with a 12-inch radius. The nut is graph tech in style. You don't actually have to lubricate them. They're supposed to be self-lubricating. But as far as neck specs go, it's 1.7 inches at the nut, and by the 12th, it increases to 2.1. So that's a fairly wide feeling neck. Then as far as first fret neck depth, we got 0.85, so that's rather thin. And if I remember correctly, that stays pretty consistent. Yeah, about 0.9. But again, the thing with this neck is it is nowhere near the same as the Gibson iteration. I remember that one because it was rather thin, but rounded like all the way throughout. But this one has the shoulders on the edge and then the back is flat. I don't personally like this style of neck, but I guess some people do. And as usual, Epiphone and Gibson go for the 24 and 3 quarters inch scale length. Face of the headstock, besides the new Epiphone shape, there's not too much going on here. It's not quite mother of pearl, it's kind of that fake pearloid stuff, so it's not just a plain old decal or anything. And your truss rod is in here if you need to use it. And the cover itself is just plain. So I put a little bit more relief within this neck because it was actually bowed up in the middle. So after I took that away, there's like a few light problem spots where it buzzes. So it's not a 100% perfect setup, but I think a little bit of spot leveling would definitely make this one even better. I would say it's passable as is, as compared to the other Epiphones I've had. This one's actually one of the nicer ones. All right, so let's give this tremolo just a little bit of a test. Now, this isn't meant to be a dive bomb. It's just meant to be a shimmer. See what I was talking about earlier with the bridge? It doesn't shake anymore. So E's a bit flat. A's about the same. D's still good. G is okay, B's good, E's okay. So this one, I actually would say it stays better in tune right out of the box, just with a little bit of modifications. All I've done was add a little bit of graphite, clean these up. I think if you put a fresh pair of strings, because the Epiphone strings are pretty much garbage, but I keep them on, that way you know what it sounds like out of the box. But it does okay, but it's not perfect. As far as the back goes, it's the same thing as the front. You've got those bright red colors here and then the dark red with the veneer over top of it. But inside here are supposed to be CTS pots and they do deliver on that promise. You can see right there, it says 500K CTS, but the wiring itself a little bit cheap and they also have the quick connect system here. So if you wanted to swap in a different type of Epiphone pickup, you could, or install those pickups into whatever you're wanting to put in here. But everything looks good within this cavity. I mean, there's a very small chip right there, but that's nothing. And your output is located on the front of the guitar on this one. You got a large strap button right here with a felt washer, and the other one is located at the base of the heel. And then as far as the neck, again, we've already talked about the profile. Not my favorite, but you might like it. But it's constructed the same way as those other Epiphones. You can see a very small scarf joint right there. Then there's another scarf joint right here. It's handcrafted in China. You got the Epiphone Cluson style deluxe tuners and your serial number. The first two digits are the year. So this is a 2019 model, but is made in November for the 2020 year lineup. Now, as far as quality control goes, besides the whole frets thing, there's a few finish issues. I mean, you can see this is like half and half where they dyed that part a little bit too much and you can also see that apparent at the top side of the headstock. So there's a few small finish things on this one. You can also notice some of that stuff around the heel. It's not too crazily bad, nothing that I would send the guitar back over. But the only thing that's bad about this one is it did get a little bit of shipping damage. You can see a few finish crack lines along the nut but usually you have to hit them in direct lighting to actually see them. Because sometimes they're just invisible, but if you get them right under the light, then you can. It's definitely worse on the treble side, but you see the bass side all the time, and that one is not as bad. This example weighs seven pounds, 6.6 .6 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now that it's taken me about four days since starting filming this to finish this video, what are my final thoughts on this thing? You know, I kind of had a love-hate relationship with this guitar. When I first got it, pulled it out of the box, I was a little bit disgusted. Some cosmetic things weren't working right, and it had a lot of fret buzzing issues, but it wasn't the worst of the Epiphones. But once I actually sat down, put it on the workbench, polished the frets up, put a little bit more relief into the neck, you know, then I started to kind of appreciate this guitar a little bit more, and the whole aesthetic vibe of it, it started to make more sense to me. Then I deleted the footage and hated this guitar. <laughs> but then today, you know, final thoughts out of everything. If I were to go into a store, pick this up, sit down and play with it, with everything that I know now, would I have taken this home? No, I would not. I think 549 is just a little bit too much of a premium. If this was 499, only a $50 premium over the other 61 styled SG, I think then you would have something because I just don't see why this unit is worth more than 50 bucks. It can't cost them $100 to make this. So even though I wouldn't necessarily recommend this one, that 449.61 reissue SG, that thing is looking really attractive because it's gonna be pretty much the exact same thing as this guitar, just without this troublesome tremolo. So I will definitely not completely write this model off. It's definitely a great value. I mean, an SG like this for $449 with a stop bar tailpiece, I mean, the absolute cheapest used Gibson is like an old SG special that's been beaten to heck. That would be about 500 bucks. So getting something that looks like the high-end version SG, I think these are a good value for people who don't want to spend the Gibson prices or cannot afford that. As far as the tone goes, it's not my favorite sounding of the Epiphones or any guitar, to be honest. The neck pickup, it was good within clean territory, but once you throw distortion on it, it just kind of got too muddy. Now the bridge pickup just didn't seem to have enough bite. Now I could potentially raise that up a little bit, but I really don't think that would make much of a difference. But it's the middle position that I actually found myself liking on both the distorted and clean channels. There's something about the combination of the two that just worked. But I mean, keep in mind, you have good quality 500K CTS pots in here. It'd be pretty easy to install your favorite set of pickups in one of these. As far as the quality control goes, it was just mainly minor stuff. But if that is all I can complain about, I think we've done okay on a guitar at this price point. So I hope you enjoyed my review of the Epiphone SG61 style with Maestro Vibrola. Before we end out this review, let's go ahead and check it out under black light. Nothing too much going on here. You get a little bit of glowing within the walrus tooth bar here. Yeah. And your pick guard has a nice glowing edge, but as far as the finish on the body, these poly finishes don't typically glow too much. But you do get a little bit right here. And hey, check out your sticker and tuners. That's kind of cool. Everything's looking good here. If you buy one of these brand new, again, you do not get a case. I just threw the cases in because they look really nice in the B-roll shots, but you could use the box that they ship in as a little makeshift case. Just add a little handle because these are pretty protective. They've got a lot of these little things. You can check out my original unboxing video if you want to see more of this, but you get a bunch of uh, paperwork and stuff in here too. So if you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Epiphone Maestro Vibrola Tremolo unit, I was initially going to return this one because of the finish cracks, but honestly, to get a replacement for this, it would be quite the wait, you know, with the way the world is right now, especially getting things from China. 
but I got this one way before that scare. So you can check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale page. Thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.